Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. And you know when you have one of those World of Warships battles where the team works flawlessly, the enemy are in complete disarray, and it's a victory before you know the battle's even started. Yeah, this isn't one of those videos. This one goes the whole nine yards. This is Chobitz 9 in the German Tier 10 cruiser, the Hindenburg. Obviously, he's in a Tier 10 ship, this is a Tier 10 match, on the trap map. This game did not look particularly promising right from the start. They have a carrier on the team, it's a Lexington, and he announces pretty much right at the start that there is absolutely no point whatsoever in him playing and he's basically either going to quit or AFK the entire match. Not a great start, although you can sympathize with him to a degree. There he is. He's a tier 8 carrier in a tier 8 battle and well, the enemy team have a Montana, a pair of Grosser Kurfürsts, an Iowa, a whole bunch of tier 9 and 10 cruisers. Basically, ships that are just suicidal for a tier 8 carrier to try to attack. Heck, even some of the enemy destroyers are going to prove to be a bit of a handful for a tier 8 carrier. So, to a degree, you can certainly sympathise with his complaints. Despite his complaints, however, he doesn't just quit the battle. He does attempt to use his aircraft to find and kill the only other Tier 8 on the enemy team, which is the enemy carrier, the enemy Lexington. You can see he's launched his dive bombers, and they're all heading straight for the far extreme of the eastern map border in order to try to head north and find the enemy carrier. So, complaints notwithstanding, he is at least trying. Meanwhile, Back to Chobitz in the Hindenburg, you can see that somebody's capping Charlie up ahead and he hasn't been spotted, so it's likely to be one of the three enemy destroyers. There he is. Ah, that's bad news. It's a Kabarovsk. Very, very bad news for the Yugamo up there, the new Japanese Tier 9 destroyer, who's contemplating sneaking into that... Well, he, in fact, he has just sneaked into the cap circle in order to try to retard the progress, and he's managed to get some shots into the Kabarovsk. But if you get into a gunfight with the Kabarovsk, and you're in the Japanese destroyer, um, yeah, it's unlikely to end well for you, and he's taken some serious hits. However, he has spotted the Kabarovsk, and there's all kinds of fire going in on him. And it's managed to successfully delay the capture of Charlie. In fact, he looks like he's just been chased right out of the cap circle, but there are some bigger ships moving in, so it's likely that the enemy team are going to capture Charlie. They're also going for Bravo. Chobitz's team appear to be taken out for more or less uncontested, as Chobitz puts some fire down on one of the Grosser Kurfürsts over there. And there's the first casualty of the game. The Yugamo, very, very foolishly indeed, chose to get into a gunfight with the Soviet Tier 10 destroyer and paid the price. There was a smokescreen over there. That's probably the Gearing, who looks like he's attempting to prevent the capture of Bravo. Good luck to him. And there's lots of fire coming in from those battleships, which very, very narrowly misses Chobitz's Hindenburg. Having a look around. Now, out of line of sight, no longer detected. Can't quite lob the shells over that island, however. The 203mm guns on the Hindenburg are... They're very, very good at shooting targets at extreme range because they have quite a flat trajectory. Unfortunately, that means that you can't really lob shots over terrain features like that island there. Also, their penetration isn't quite as good as that enjoyed by the American and Japanese cruisers with the 203mm guns, so armor-piercing performance against battleships can be inconsistent, unless you've got the broad flat side of the ship to shoot at at relatively short range, and we're talking 10 kilometers or less. Shooting at the Iowa now, he's got the high explosive loaded, the Iowa is angled, There's, he's going to do minimal damage with the armor-piercing, see what the high explosive can do. The problem here is that the high explosive on the Hindenburg is um, well, let's be charitable and just say it's not very good. In fact, it's abysmal. There we go. Oh, Iowa is definitely returning fire. That's a lot of fire. That is a lot of fire. It's all falling short, however. He's launched his spotter plane. This is going to extend the range of his guns. The Hindenburg's also a fairly big target. It has a surface detection range of 16 kilometers. Although, if you've got the relevant crew skills, and equipment modules fitted, you can drop that down to ooh, something like 12 kilometers, which means you can stealth fire with this ship, because with the right equipment modules fitted, you can have the range of these guns out to something like 20.7 kilometers. He's not really getting the opportunity to do that here, however. 
as he continues to rain down the high explosive shells on that Iowa. It looks like the Iowa is either stopped or is reversing. Let's see where these shells land. Let me set him on fire at last. And he's hit him enough times, he's only just managed to set him on fire. There it is, he's burning quite nicely. It does look like that Iowa is seriously slowing down. All of those shots aimed at the bows of the ship landed short. He's either slowed or he's reversing, so he adjusts his shots. They've lost another destroyer. Looks like, yep, I think it was the Gearing who attempted to stop the capture of Bravo. He did manage to arrest the capture progress, but then he got himself sunk. And they managed to hold Bravo and Charlie. And they're actually taking Alpha off them as well. Another good thing about the Hindenburg is a very, very impressive anti-aircraft rating, which is going to make life intensely frustrating for the Lexington on the enemy team. Couple that with the defensive fire cooldown and nothing gets anywhere near this ship if it flies. Chobitz, however, has not picked the defensive fire cooldown. He's got the repair consumable. Tier 10 cruisers get repair consumables. He's got hydroacoustic search and he's taken a spotter plane to extend the range of his guns. And I suppose that's a sensible choice to make because, well, not many people play carry. Oh, hello. Kill steel coming up right here. Yes. <laughs> okay. It was a bit of a cheap kill, but hey, a kill's a kill. Pair of Hindenburgs rounding the corner. A whole bunch of enemy ships over there. A whole bunch of enemy ships over there as well. Ah, enemy destroyer. Crap, 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 crap. High explosive loaded. Get around, get around, get around. And he's gone gonna fire anyway because hey you never know your luck there are the torpedoes yes yeah, all those coming a mile away is that a full torpedo launch or can we expect there to be more you know I'm not entirely sure well he's dodged those torpedoes anyway and the destroyer has made himself scarce so he's oh wait there he is right come on two Hindenburgs <laughs> Spotted by two Hindenburgs. I really don't fancy his chances. And I think it's going to be the... Yep, he's gone. Okay. The friendly Hindenburg claims the kill. Meanwhile, having dealt with the enemy Kagero, Chobits and this friendly Hindenburg are now capping Bravo. Oh, hang on a minute. The Lexington isn't the only Tier 8 on the enemy team, is it? The Kagero's not Tier 9 anymore. Of course, it's a Tier 8 destroyer. Well, it was. It's dead now. He's managed to set the Izumo on fire. They've basically got the broadsides of three battleships to shoot at here. Now, to be fair to these three battleships, they're chasing down two friendly battleships, so they've all got their armour angled against the two battleships, but that's really, really good news for the two Hindenburgs on their flank. Chobits, testing his luck with the armour piercing against the Montana up there, the Hindenburg with him, firing high explosive, and oop, four and a half thousand damage, not bad. Second salvo already in the air, and it's looking pretty good. Eight and a half thousand damage. Chobits, watch out for that island up ahead as the third salvo arcs in towards the target. Eight thousand seven hundred damage and oops, he's run himself aground. Luckily, however, the Izumo has now passed the gap in between those two islands up ahead and is no longer in a position to shoot at him, so he is able to reverse off the rocks and get himself underway again as the two of them just continue to rain the fire down on that poor Montana who's just getting obliterated. Team's about to lose, it's 90 points to 708, and that's when the Yamato gets the killing blow on the Montana. Buys the team some breathing space. The scores are 135, 139 to 666, but the enemy team control two flags, and it's only Chobits and the other Hindenburg who've managed to capture Bravo. They still have two enemy Tier 9 and 10 battleships to deal with, however, starting with the Grosser Kurfürst. Chobitz is trying his luck with the armor piercing ammunition. He had some pretty good results against the Montana, and he's having inconsistent results against the Grosser Kurfürst. He's getting shot at from behind. Is that the Iowa? You'd expect the Iowa to be doing a bit more damage than that. No, it's the Kabarovsk. Well, okay, if the Kabarovsk is back there, that must mean that the smokescreen up front has been laid by the Fletcher because he's the only other surviving destroyer on the enemy team. Scores are 88 to 745. Somebody needs to sink the Grosser Kur first. It's five ships surviving against nine enemies, although it was ten enemies a minute ago until they sunk the Montana. 
again, inconsistent results. And now the Kabarovsk is sneaking into Bravo now that these two Hindenburgs have vacated it to chase these two battleships down. So they're stuck at 88 points unless somebody sinks something. And he's done it. He's sunk the Grosser. Kerr first. Again, breathing space bought for the team. But now he has himself some Ismo problems. And the Ismo is not pointing his guns at the Yamato. The secondaries are opening up. The primaries are just waiting to load. Here it comes. And... Yeah, that was a fair old amount of damage, but he's doing plenty of damage in return. At this kind of range, he can barely miss the Izumo, and he's got the flat side of the ship to shoot at. With high velocity, low trajectory armor piercing, he's scoring citadels, he's getting penetrations. The Izumo does not like this, his own secondaries are opening up. He's actually inside, well inside Alpha now, if they can sink this Izumo. That's going to buy some more breathing space for the team, and it's going to allow them to capture Alpha, because right now they don't hold any flags. The enemy team are at 769 points, but his armor piercing at that kind of angle is starting to bounce. He's raised his shots to try to put the armor piercing into the superstructure instead for more damage, but he's still getting bounces. The torpedoes are away, and it's the final salvo that sinks the Ismo, buys them a few more points, reduces the enemy's progress, and now... They can just avoid getting hit, and they can capture Alpha, because they badly need a flag under their belt. It's the Iowa and the Kabarovsk. The Kabarovsk has managed to avoid all the torpedoes fired by the gearing. The two of them are now in a gunfight, and, well, my money's on the gearing. The Kabarovsk is a very, very nasty destroyer, but he doesn't have an awful lot of health, and the gearing does. And Chobits is helping him out as he gets some repairs underway. It's vitally important that they capture, however, because the enemy team are piling the points on, and they don't hold any flags, so the only points they're getting are from sinking enemy ships, and they're still heavily outnumbered. He's launched his spotter plane, he's going for the Iowa. Switch back to the high explosive for this. That Kabarovsk is taking a beaten, and they've almost capped. Enemy team are at 793 points. They keep piling the points on, but they've managed to take one of the flags off them. It's still not looking good, though, because the enemy team are now at over 800 points again, and that's when the gearing finishes off the Kabarovsk. Time after time after time, this team is in serious danger of losing, and they're not out of the woods yet, but then somebody nails one of the enemy ships right when they needed to and keeps them in the game. That Iowa has seriously overextended, however. He's just burned his damage control ability after Chobit set him on fire. He's given up the chase on the gearing. The gearing's retired into a smokescreen. But now, the Hindenburg and the Montana <laughs> have the side of the Iowa to shoot at, just as he turned and made himself a big, fat, juicy target. So that's one further enemy battleship down and finally for the first time since the beginning of the game while the scores aren't even the enemy team still have a 500 point lead at least the number of ships are even the enemy team do still have a very commanding points lead however and that's why the friendly Hindenburg up ahead has sneaked back into Bravo and he's blocking it neither side control it it's still red but with the Hindenburg in there the enemy team aren't gaining points from it so right now it's one flag each and the Montana, who just sank the Iowa, has just taken out the enemy Fletcher as well. So the points gap is narrowing even further. And for the first time this game, Chobit's team now outnumbers the enemy. That's still a big old difference in points, however. At this point, surely the enemy team have got to be thinking, how do you fuck this up? <laughs> they were leading by something like 700 points. They had 10 ships to the 5 surviving ships on Chobit's team. And... Suddenly they're outnumbered. They can still win, however, providing they hold onto the flags that they have and they do not lose any more ships. The enemy team should really be falling back to Charlie right now, preserving what health they have and just riding out the clock, holding onto their points lead and winning the game. The whole no cap kill all mentality can have very, very serious consequences. It seriously? Really? It's the Minotaur. Broadside on, armor piercing salvo. Oh my lordy lordy lordy. <laughs> Just got double teamed by the Hindenburgs. But wait, it's not over yet. Here comes the enemy Hindenburg. Obviously saw what happened to the Minotaur and thought, hmm, I want some of that. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Chobits and the friendly Hindenburg, only too happy to oblige. 
I hear you like armor piercing at point blank range, so I've got some armor piercing to pierce your armor at point blank range. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, <laughs> well, he did manage to do some damage to the friendly Hindenburg before he went down, but I, I really don't think it was worth it. Now there's only two enemy ships left. One of those is a carrier. We don't know where he is. And now the grosser cure first decides, actually, maybe it's not a good idea. <laughs> to attempt to kill everything on the enemy team. Perhaps I should be running away. And they can still do it. Look at the points difference. Okay, they're starting to capture Bravo, but the enemy team still hold Charlie. And if that guy can get away intact without dying, there is not an awful lot of time left in this match, less than five minutes. The carrier and that battleship just have to stay alive and hide. And they'll win on points. So it is imperative that Chobitz's team do not let this Curryverst get away. And he's turned broadside on, and he is burning heavily. But he's turned broadside on not because he's stupid, but because he's desperate. He needs to get behind that island. And, well, frankly, I think it's probably worth the risk. He's burned his damage control ability to put the fires out. They've almost capped Bravo, but now Chobitz is starting to come under fire. And he's hit, and that's retarded the capture of Bravo. The Grosser Cur first secondaries are now opening up on him, but Chobitz has managed to get the high caliber award here. He's now done 213,000 damage to go with a Confederate that he just scored earlier, but the Grosser Cur first has managed to get away intact. And he still has a lot of health. They have just about managed to capture Bravo, but it's not going to be enough. The enemy team still have too many points, and there is not enough time, less than three and a half minutes of this game remaining, for them to win purely on capture points. They need to sink at least the Gros Secure first over there, and they probably, based on how many points they have and how long there is left, they probably also need to sink that enemy carrier. At this point, the gearing decides, screw it, I'm going to cap Charlie. Which, well, it's probably a case of too little too late, but you never know, he may spot the carrier when he's up that end of the map. So, it's worth trying. Enemy fighters overhead... And they can't do any damage, because they're fighters, they're not dive bombers, they're not torpedo bombers, but they're keeping Chobitz spotted. And he hasn't managed to shoot them all down. The enemy carrier, tier 8 carrier, tier 10 battle, he probably hasn't done a lot of damage in this game, but he's still playing a vital role. He's, well, he's not keeping them spotted anymore. Oh wait, yes he is. Hang on a minute. Enemy fighters are heading south in the direction of the Montana. That must be the spotter aircraft. Well, the catapult fighter from the Grosser Kerr first. We're not seeing it. Yep, there he is. But since it's a spotter plane, it's actually orbiting the Grosser Kerr first, and it's just turned in again, and yeah. And he's detected again, and those are returning fighters from the enemy carrier. Torpedoes ahead, fired by the gearing, as he just about starts nosing into Alpha. If he can get in there, he can stop the enemy accumulating more points from holding Alpha. And there are enemy dive bombers coming in. His anti-aircraft guns are opening up. But he's got bigger problems to worry about. There's the curve first. Broadside on. He's been hit by the dive bombers and set on fire. He manages to sit at for 15,000 damage, the curve first, as his primaries and secondaries open up and do a large amount of damage. But the curve first has just spotted the torpedoes in the water launched by the gearing. And he appears to have just shit his pearly German panties, because I think at least two of those are going to hit. And the gearing takes him out. And is capping Alpha. Well played, the gearing. Some spectacular teamwork going on here. But it's not going to be enough, even if they take Charlie. And they are going to take Charlie. The enemy team just still have too many points. And there's barely a minute remaining. They need to find and kill that carrier. And as if by magic, the gearing noses far enough into Charlie that he has a clear line of sight to the Lexington. And there he is. Chobits, however, spotted by aircraft, so all hope of a sneak attack, gone. More dive bombers coming in, but it's an understrength squadron. Still, if they get lucky, they only have to set him on fire once, and he could be in serious trouble because his damage control is on cooldown. He's managed to nail two of them. The final surviving bomber drops his bomb and misses, and he's nailed him before he can get back to the carrier, and he's managed to set the carrier on fire with the admittedly pretty terrible high explosive on the Hindenburg. 
but there's less than a minute left. He's switching to the armor piercing, but that's a lot of bounces. <laughs> Inconsistent performance with the armor piercing on the Hindenburg against angled targets. And, oh, that's better, but it's not quite going to be enough. There are barely seconds of this game left. Come on, reload the guns. And he's got him. How much time left on the clock? Yeah, that was pretty close. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they come much closer than that. 261,000 damage done. High caliber and confederate. 3,257 base experience. I haven't seen many games where you've scored more base experience than that. And the Lexington managed to get over a thousand base experience as well, despite the fact that he wouldn't stop bitching about the matchmaking all the way through the match. He actually did quite well out of it. Most of that probably from spotting damage. Likewise, the enemy Lexington actually finished in the top three. I'm not suggesting for a second that you're going to have an easy time of it if you find yourself in a tier 8 carrier in a tier 10 battle, but by no means is it worth giving up, as these scores certainly prove. But this one was really all about Chobitz, with a legendary game with a nail-biting ending in the German tier 10 cruiser, as he took it for a little jaunt around the trap map in domination mode here in World of Warships. Hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.